That was wonderful. I hadn't heard that song before, but uh, into week two of our Adventures in Faith program. I forget how our philosophy, our colleagues started doing Adventures in Faith. It was, gosh, 20 years ago almost. And, and um, I love Adventures in Faith because it's that time of year in the fall when we can begin to dive deep into our spiritual, spirituality and our beliefs and our spiritual practices. And, and it's my hope that with the programming that we've put together for you, that you will find yourselves with a faith lift, right? A faith lift, yes. Many of you might want something else, but a faith lift will do for now. It's the best I can do. <laughs> I think this is the, the time of year for me that I like to look at where it is that's my growing edge. What is it that I need to go to do to, be, to go a little deeper? And so this year's Adventures in Faith program, uh, the name is Let Your Love Ripple Outward. And the idea is to mimic, if you will, that basic tenet in our philosophy that we, we go in first and then we ripple outward. And so this uh, Adventures in Faith program double t dovetails really nicely with our annual theme of living out loud and so as we uh, do the different workshops that we're doing after services and, um, and the talks this month on paradox, I really invite you to uh, do some deep contemplation about where you find value in this community. Where is it that you feel supported? One of the pieces of this Adventures in Faith program is for us to recommit to our spiritual path and to renew our commitment to this community. And that includes our um, financial commitment. And so we gave out programs for folks when they came in. Did everyone get a nice program? I forgot to bring one up. Uh, if you need one, uh, Ray's got some here. Raise your hand. We'll make sure you get one. It, it, in the program, it describes all the activities that we're doing uh, this month that you will want to be part of. Today we're going to have a town hall meeting and, and um, next week we'll be doing a visioning and then we're going to have a celebration. And also in it is a commitment card. And so I'd love for you to look at that commitment card and to mindfully think about the value that you receive as being part of this community and to let us know what your financial commitment will be for 2024. It really helps us to plan our year out and it helps you to invest in something you value. There's a treasure chest at the back of the room and you can put your card in there. If you want to take it home and put it on your altar and give it some thought, um, you can do that as well. And we're also including a link if you want to do it digitally. But the the, the real purpose of it is for us to come within and to begin to look at that place of where we want to invest our time, our talent, and our treasure. Also in the program this week, our giveaway, is this beautiful mandala card. And on the other side of it is one of my favorite prayers. It's a, actually a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. Um, or Avila, depending upon how you pronounce that. The, I have actually been to Avila in Spain, and I have seen the, uh, the community that was built up around this powerful woman's work. Um, St. Teresa was a 15th century mystic and nun, Carmelite nun. She started the Carmelite order, and uh, she was a spiritual badass. And the reason she was a spiritual badass is because her love for God was so rich and so deep that she knew that it was actually innate to who she was. And she taught that to all the Car Carmelite nuns. And then when they merged with a monastic order, she and John of the Cross taught that to their devotees. And so she, I've, I've, I've uh, took some liberties with this beautiful prayer, and I'm going to read it to you. Uh, and, and I've entitled it, You Give, 
spirit life. Spirit has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Your, yours are the eyes through which it looks lovingly on this world. Yours are the feet with which it walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which it blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, yours are, it, you are its body. Spirit has no body on earth but yours. Yeah, beautiful, 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 beautiful prayer. And I invite that to be your prayer as we move through this uh, committed giving and Adventures in Faith program to look at how it is you want to show up as the hands, the feet, the voice, the eyes, the incarnation of God. And as you're valuing what, uh, where, what, you know, how this community is serving you on your spiritual path, I invite you to also think about what this community has to offer others who may have been in the same position that you were in when you discovered this community and this philosophy, that, that we have uh, this wonderful gift of helping people to sort of reverse polarities and instead of looking out into the world first for what it is that will fulfill them, we have a philosophy that teaches us that we go inside first. We begin to do our spiritual practice and get centered and grounded in the power and the presence of the one life and the one infinite reality. And as we ground ourselves in that, that's where our expression comes out into the world full body. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the, that's the real um, power of our adventures in faith this month. And we are talking about paradox this this month as well, and I love how it, that too kind of dovetails because we, we don't really think about our philosophy as a, a paradox, um, but, but I am t you know, reminded, and I had to look up the definition because I use the word kind of offhandedly, but when we are working with paradox, we're usually working with things that feel self-conflicting, you know, self like there's some kind of uh, conflicting idea that um, has, seems to have two opposites. It's, it, it feels dualistic. And yet, when we can tease out and really look at both sides of the coin, if you will, we can often come to a third way. And as we explore paradox, I can see examples of them in the world. Any Dodgers fans here today? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the Dodgers have this amazing pitcher, <laughs> Clayton Kershaw, and he's a paradox. And the reason he's a paradox is usually during the regular season, he is an amazing pitcher. And as soon as postseason play starts, he chokes. <laughs> and yesterday's game, where he gave up five runs before the first out in the first inning was a complete demonstration of a paradox. It was quite amazing to watch. If you're, if you're not a baseball, pan, uh, baseball fan, I appreciate you um, humoring me uh, <laughs> in my, as I look at paradoxes and I see where I see them out in the world. Um, all kidding aside, uh, this practice of looking at paradox really helps us to expand our thinking. And in a time in our world where we find things changing quite rapidly, paradox can really aid us and paradoxical thinking can aid us as things begin to change and we, have, we get really invested and attached to the way things are. And then we see all these things changing around us and maybe we're even asked to consider a different way of being. And looking at paradox allows us to see the value in uh, one thing versus the perceived other and to um, look at how we might be able to um, benefit from uh, the different ways of thinking, how we might be able to benefit from um, 
looking at the world through two different lenses. It also serves us to look at not only how we can benefit, but to acknowledge and discern those things uh, uh, where we're looking at two different ways of, of viewing the world or our reality, to also look at the ways where the paradoxes, the different ways of thinking, might keep us stuck, right? Because it's not just about trying to find benefits. Sometimes there's some stuff we're really ready to let go of. It's not working, and we're not going to use those things. And so it re it, I'm not just saying, you know, look for the good. <laughs> I'm also saying let go of what doesn't serve. As we do this process of looking at, you know, the song came to mind as I was putting my remarks together, should I stay or should I go, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the, the paradox we find ourselves in sometimes is what should we do? And so if we can look at the benefits and then we can look at the things that aren't serving us, oftentimes we'll come to a place that might transform the situation. Um, but it does require us to be vulnerable and open and flexible. Some of the things that um, uh, we can benefit or, or that will be the byproduct of pushing uh, or pressing into the status quo are things like it enhances creativity, it increases our ability to do complex problem solving, it helps us be more adaptable and resilient, it improves our decision-making skills, enhances our communication skills, sparks innovation, and supports conflict resolution. That's quite a package, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, this idea of paradoxical thinking, it's meaty. And, I, and, and when we look at how we can begin to really embrace paradoxical thinking, I think it can really help us when we're stuck. Am I the only one who gets stuck once in a while? <laughs> yeah, it's just me. <laughs> it's just me. Am I the only one who struggles with change once in a while? <laughs> right, right. It, it, it is sometimes hard to change. And perhaps you've heard that um, in order to grow, change, and evolve, we sometimes have to, um, so we sometimes have to leave our comfort zone. So if you can't read the cartoon, <laughs> <laughs> we have a shark looking at a shark tank. He says, you'll never grow as a person if you don't leave your comfort zone. <laughs> and sometimes that's what it feels like, right? Leaving our comfort zone feels like we might be swimming into shark-infested waters. But that's where your spiritual practice comes in. That's where your faith comes in. When you begin to leave your comfort zone, doing, at least this is how it works for me. I, when I do my spiritual practice, whether it's spiritual mind treatment, affirmative prayer, meditation, visioning is a big practice we've been doing here at the center this month and last month and we'll continue to do. These practices help ground me so that I can access that divine intelligence that is innate in all life. And so there is, there's some trust that we have to have in order to, to leave our comfort zone of the places that we have been um, found pretty cozy and safe. And I'm not suggesting that um, by uh, practicing paradoxical thinking that, um, that you put yourself in an unsafe place. But I am suggesting that when you are in spiritual community, and when you are doing spiritual practice and when you are grounded in your faith, that you are safe. That, and that there will be some new ideas and some uh, new suggestions, some new thinking that might come up for you. And sometimes we get stuck though. And Ernest Holmes gets whimsical in the Science of Mind textbook when he writes about how the power of prayer and how it works and how this philosophy works, this idea that we plant a seed in the uh, mind with a capital M, it moves through the creative process and it comes into form. It is very dependent upon our beliefs. And so Ernest Holmes writes this. Hence it follows that if we believe that it will not work, it really works by appearing to not work. <laughs> and when we believe that it cannot and will not, then, according to principle, it does not. But when it does not, it still does. 
only it does according to our belief that it will not. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the page 52 paradox. <laughs> it, it is indeed a paradoxical thinking to, to re realize that even when things aren't working, they're working because I believe they won't work. <laughs> uh-huh, right. Have you, have you ever um, uh, have been in that situation where you um, absolutely are certain that something isn't going to work out and you really get vested in the negativity and then you move through it and you look back and you say, oh, God, I think I created all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, boy, especially I think religious scientists because we are trained to pay attention to thinking <laughs> where I'm trying to figure things out, where I get really attached to what I believe, where I become very um, resistant to what someone else believes when it's contrary to what I believe, right? We get... We get, this, I think the saying is we get set in our ways. We do. We begin to really um, we, I think what happens for me, and I'm not sure if this is your experience, is that I forget to be curious. I forget to inquire. I for, you know, when somebody else is really passionate, I was following a car on Pico this morning. And the back of their car was very politically divergent to how I hold politics. <laughs> I will just say that. And it really doesn't matter what side of the street you're on. And I, am, I was remembering when there were things that were really shifting politically and I was sort of like, what the heck is going on? You know, I was, I was, I was sort of in that, you know, wanting everybody to understand why it was so important to think the way I do. Uh-huh. <laughs> None of you have ever done that, I'm certain. <laughs> and um, I decided that I would sit through the political party's national convention that was converse to what, you know, my politics. And so I made the commitment, and I made the commitment to watch it. And I'm not going to tell you it was easy, but I will tell you I began to see and understand that they, while the values were not necessarily my own, I saw the commitment to a value that was really important to the speakers and the people who were, that, that you know, and I could see myself, but it was the mirror image, right? Yeah. I, I, I won't say that that really changed my politics, <laughs> but I will say it broadened my perspective and my understanding and my compassion and my kindness. And I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. Now, I'm supposed to talk to you this morning about getting comfortable with discomfort. That is one of the stages of dropping into paradoxal thinking and beginning to witness our discomfort and then to be curious about what it is that's causing that dis discomfort. I have, like many of you, experienced a lot of change in my life. You know, I can, re you know, maybe you're the same way. I can remember those pivotal points where something happened, something that was either heartbreaking or wonderful and changed the direction of my life. And so, so I, 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 and when I came to this teaching, I had this idea that I needed extreme discomfort to shift. You know, I needed crisis. I needed heartbreak in order to, you know, change or to, or, or to, get out of whatever situation I was, was in. And I was, it was an Adventures in Faith program, similar to this one. We, were, we had little small groups that were meeting weekly. And, um, and I remember saying out loud, I think I'm done with needing crisis. 
to take steps forward and to be proactive. And that is one of the uh, gifts that I have been given through this philosophy. I've been given the gift of knowing that when I hit that bump in the road, that something that is causing discomfort for me, I don't have to wallow in it. I use it as a... Um, I use it as, a, as, a, as a, an opportunity for me to raise my uh, spiritual eyes, to open my awareness, to, to look at what it is that I'm stuck in and how can I, you know, what is it that I'm being called to change? And um, the other thing that I have learned about discomfort when I come in contact with it is first I, I really I need to acknowledge and feel my feelings and discomfort um, otherwise I'm going to project it all out on you <laughs> that doesn't serve anybody but what I have found is that discomfort can lead me to those um, you know I have I'll, I'll say it this way I have a love-hate relationship with AFCOs have you have you familiar with AFCOs mm. Another freaking growth opportunity. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so when I have those discomfortable places, those uncomfortable places, when I'm feeling um, discomfort, when I'm feeling uneasy, it's a cue that there's something for me to tease out. There's, it's a cue for me to go back to my spiritual practice. It's a cue for me to go back to my values and to ground myself so that I know what, what's next to do. I think that's what they mean when they talk about growing pains, right? Yeah, yeah, we have growing pains individually, we have growing pains in our institutions, we have growing pains in our government, we have growing pains everywhere. And so it's our opportunity to look at those places where we um, we need to let go and we need to begin to consider change and we need to, to look at how our values can lead us forward and, and, and what it is it that we're too attached to. One of the things that um, I find with paradoxical thinking when I am uh, beginning to work with trying to get comfortable with discomfort is it gives me the ability to um, as I already said, feel my feelings and begin to understand that I might have contradictory emotions around things. And to give voice, at least in my head or processing with a close friend or a confidant, what those emotions are and what they're trying to tease up in me. Oftentimes by embracing um, it, the love-hate relationship that I might have with something, I can begin to... Uh, Drop my resistance to change. Drop my resistance to change. I think sometimes looking, trying to balance the push and the pull of two separate ideas can help to um, open our eyes and raise our awareness to the things that uh, scare us, that we might be afraid of, and the things that motivate us, and how we can... Uh, find that intersection between fear and motivation to maybe find a, a new way to move forward. It's, uh, this comfort can bring us to a place of mindful engagement where we can begin to have a greater self-awareness of what's ours to do and what's ours to let go of, right? I think the place that I have um, really found a great deal of value is in embracing uncertainty. I, I mean, I like to know. <laughs> I like to know how things are going to work out, and I like to see it, you know, down the road and have my plans. But there is something about embracing uncertainty that makes me more available to a bigger picture. Because when I know, right? You ever, do you ever have the experience where someone comes up and they start telling you about something and you maybe at first in your mind you're like, oh yeah, I know, I've been there, I've done that. Uh-huh, okay, sure. 
that's, that's the place of, of shutting down. But if we can open up and listen and see if there's something in it, this for us, it might be uncomfortable to leave the safe harbor of our knowing so that we can be open to a new idea. I think the times that we live in call for this right now. They call for us to be courageous and vulnerable enough to be open to new possibilities. Because at least from my vantage point, it feels like we're circling the bowl. <laughs> and in order to get out of that circular thinking of trying to do the same things and expecting different results, we need to begin to look at and be open to different possibilities. Brene Brown in the Atlas of the Heart writes this, in these challenging moments of dissonance, we need to stay curious and resist choosing comfort over courage. It's brave to invite new information to the table, to sit with it and hear it out. It's also rare these days. It is. It's also very rare these days. But we are um, religious scientists. We're on a spiritual path, path to have a greater experience of the divine in everything that we do. We are the, the hands. <laughs> We are the feet, we are the eyes, and we are the body of God in form. And so my invitation to you this week is to really think about that, to, to let that filter into your consciousness and be mindful of this idea when somebody said something and you have that knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, I have them too. And if you're aware enough, you might be able to catch the knee-jerk reaction before you have it <laughs> so that you can be open to listen, at least compassionately. You don't have to agree. But to be compassionate to the other perspective and to see if there is anything in there for you that might help you to move forward, to grow and to evolve and to be more, a more authentic expression of the body of spirit as you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's do that thing we do so well, that spiritual technology I refer to as affirmative prayer. And taking a deep breath and feeling grounded in the spot that we're in knowing that the innermost God and the highest God are one God, that there is a place within us where spirit is full-bodied, alive, and self-aware of itself. And so we allow ourselves to drop into that place within, to be grounded in midair, in the heart, and in the arms of spirit so that as we walk out through our week, as we find those places of dissonance and discomfort, that we are brave enough and courageous enough to know that it is our spiritual practice that supports us when we look at the things that feel opposite to what we think we want. And so we walk through this week asking that simple question, what is it that you want me to know, Spirit? And how can I serve its highest good? And centered in this idea of being the expression of Spirit in the world, I trust that each one is guided, guarded, and, and protected. That being vulnerable is 
absolutely okay, that we are safe, grounded in our spirit, grounded in our faith, walking outward from within, knowing that we are about the business of God's work and it always supports its work. So having great gratitude for this highest truth, I know for each one that that gratitude and these blessings carry us forward as we continue to press into paradox, as we continue to be open to newness, and as we continue to trust that each step forward leads us back home. And together we say, and so it is. <laughs>